If you haven't taken my class or a class in one of the clusters that I teach in, you might not have encountered this before. But um, something that I do a little bit different is I write these things that I call plus standard quizzes or plus quizzes or plus tests. Basically, starting in, I want to say, the fall or winter of 2015, I started writing these harder assessments that went along with the assessments that my classes were taking in AP Calculus, AB, AP Calculus BC, as well as Honors Pre-Cal, or whatever other course I happen to be working on. Every question is scaled up a little bit in difficulty, and over the years I've sort of tweaked the formula for how much each question is worth. So I've been offering these for a while. Um, I really enjoy writing them. They're kind of fun for me, and they're fun for me to both write and solve because the questions are pretty tough. And this year I've had fewer people doing them overall, which makes sense. Coming out of the pandemic, that makes sense. But at the same time, um, I appreciate the students who are kind of pushing themselves this way. And sure, there's a little bit of an incentive of a possibility of extra credit, but there's a, there's a trade-off for that for sure. It's definitely challenging. So to um, offer us a little bit of help here, or not even really just help, but to sort of show and indulge in the amount of joy I have in doing these things and thinking about like twists and tricky calculus problems, I wanted to go through and just work up one video where I went through the most recent um, Calculus AB plus standard quiz. So there are 14 questions here. Uh, I'm going to link to the PDF of this standard quiz in the description if you'd like to take a look at it. But otherwise, I'm just going to attempt to work through these things, talking through as much as I can, but also just sort of doing the problems and hopefully getting the same answers that I got before and scored um, the students that took it with. So without further ado, so begins the plus standard quiz. So let's see. So question number one. In Calculus AB's third quarter, this is focused on just evaluating limits, but you know, in this plus standard quiz, there's lots of things that could happen here. So first of all, the limit is x goes to negative infinity of a combination of some exponential pieces as well as some polynomial pieces. We've got two quadratic terms and we've got two exponential terms. So now, if this was going to positive infinity, we would just do negative e to the x over 6 e to the x and get negative 1 sixth, but it's not. So in other words, if we were to evaluate the limit of the numerator here, we'd get 4 times infinity minus e to the negative infinity. That's just going to go to 0, but that means this is approaching infinity. And down below, we'd get 6 e to the negative infinity, which again goes to 0, but then minus 7 times infinity. So this is infinity over infinity, which suggests to me that we should use L'Hopital's rule, a technique that we have available to us. So let's take a stab at it. I'm going to rewrite the limit of the ratio of the derivatives of each of the numerator and denominator. It's going to be 8x minus e to the x and 6e to the x minus 14x. Now you can probably already see what's happening here. If we were to evaluate this one, we'd still end up with infinity stuff. We'd have 8 times negative infinity minus 0, and down below we'd have, well, 0 minus, well, 14 times negative infinity. So in this case, we still have something that's approaching infinity over infinity, which means that we can once again use L'Hopital's. But because we've gotten those quadratic terms down to linear, I'm thinking this will be the end of our battle. So we'll evaluate the limit once more as x goes to negative infinity of 8 minus e to the x. And again, the derivative e to the x is e to the x. That's why it's not going anywhere. 6 e to the x minus 14. Now when we evolve or evaluate via direct substitution, we'll get 8 minus e to the negative infinity. I'll go back and put that in there just for clarity. This will be 6 e to the negative infinity minus 14. If we evaluate e to the negative infinity, I'll do that off to the side here just to kind of make it clear. It's the same thing as 1 over e to the infinity. And if you multiply e, 2.718281828459023533, etc., by itself infinity times, that's the same thing as just approaching infinity, which means that term is in fact zero should establish that at the beginning. That means our expression over here is going to be 8 minus 0 over 0 minus 14, which is going to be 8 over negative 14, also known as negative 4 sevenths. First one done. Our second problem, the tangent line to y equals 1 third x cubed minus 7 halves x squared is perpendicular to y equals 1 twelfth x. So that's giving us some information about the slope, something we're going to differentiate. Next, we need to find one of the two possible tangent lines. I'll plan to find both, but we can at least kick this off. So first of all, if we are perpendicular to y equals 1 12th x, that means the slope of the tangent line has to be the negative reciprocal of 1 12th. So that means that the slope of our tangent line is going to have to be negative 1 over 1 12th or negative 12. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the derivative of this function that we're talking about the tangent line for, which is going to end up being x squared 
minus 7x. And we're going to set that equal to negative 12 because then we'll find the x values where the slope is appropriately negative 12. From there, I can move the negative 12 over. I'll get x squared oops, minus 7x plus 12 equals 0. And that means that x minus 3 times x minus 4 is 0. And that's enough for us to see that x is either equal to 3 or x is equal to 4. Now, of course, in here, the, the problem's not super clean no matter how we choose to do it based on those denominators. So forgive me for that. But at the same time, we can now go proceed from here. So first of all, with each value, we have to find the corresponding y value. That's actually the only challenge that we have left in this problem is finding the y value. So first, if x is equal to 3, y is going to be 1 third times 3 cubed minus 7 halves times 3 squared. You know what? I'm just going to write 9. Like I, I'll just be honest. Like I do this a little bit faster than that. This is going to be 27 over 3, which is 9, minus 7 halves of 9. If we get a common denominator here, that's going to be 18 over 2 minus 63 over 2. And yeah, we have to think about this a little bit. I want to say that's going to be negative 45 over 2. I can check myself there. I'm pretty sure that's right, though. Um, so negative 45 over 2 would be our y value for that piece. And I'm going to go ahead and make a different color here so we can see these in just a second. For our second one, I'll use plum. If x is equal to 4, then that's going to correspond to a y value of 64 over 3. Yeah, I got to do this a little bit faster. 7 over 2 times 16. That's going to be 7 over 2 times 16. Well, that's 7 times 8, which is 56, the old buddy fact. From here, if we get a common denominator, we're going to have 64 over 3 minus 56. That's 150, 18, 168 over 3, which is going to be negative 104 over 3. So with those two pieces in place, we have enough to write our two tangent lines. So y, and let's see, our y value for the first one was negative 45 over 2. It's going to be equal to negative 12 times x minus 3. And for our plum option, the second option, we have y plus 104 over 3 is equal to negative 12 times x minus 4. And by the way, we didn't have to do any heavy lifting with the slope, because remember the whole point here was that the tangent lines had slopes that made them perpendicular to 112x. So there we go. We have both answers. Quick check. Yes. Got him. Got him. Number three. Um, I'd say this is one of the cleaner and simpler ones here. It just takes a little bit of work to get there. Ask us to compute x or q double prime of 1, the second derivative, for q of x equals ln of this thing. Now, the first thing I want to do, by the way, just to make sure, is these could always be a trick question. That would be a thing I might do. So this would be the ln of 1 minus 4 plus 9. Let's make sure that 1 is in the domain of the function. And in fact, it is. That's ln of 6. So 1 is safely in our domain. So let's go see what happens here. So first, I'm going to calculate q prime of x. For a natural log function, it's going to be pretty simple. Our denominator will be x squared minus 4x plus 9. Our numerator is going to be 2x minus 4. To calculate the second derivative, we're going to have to use the quotient rule. So low d high, the derivative of high is just 2, minus high d low, and the derivative of low is 2x minus 4 for obvious reasons. That's the whole reason we got the 2x minus 4 up there. All over low, <laughs> did that again, low quotient rule. So there we go. So we've got our quotient rule in place. Now we need to evaluate this. Keep in mind, it looks like there's things that might divide out, but obviously you know not to. We can't just slash those two because they aren't everywhere. But at this point, I find what's actually kind of, I think the cleanest way to go is just to plug in one right now and go from there. Um, I don't always do it this way, but I think it helped. And we already know that the argument's equal to six at one. So basically we're gonna end up with six times two. Over here, we're gonna have minus negative two squared, all divided by six squared. So this becomes 12 minus 4 over 36. And there's 4s and stuff we can pull out here, but I'll just wait one more step. That's 8 over 36. We can factor out a 4 from each of those. This is 2 ninths. So there is our second derivative at 2. So the graph of that ln function is concave up at x equals 1. It didn't ask that, but at least we know. Number four, I think four is one of the first ones where it becomes like truly crunchy. It's just like there's a lot of stuff happening here. 
we want to compute the derivative, so using the chain rule, this is a good clue, of 4 square root of cosine of the square root of sine. So again, you can break this down if you want to, to be extra careful. I'm just going to go sort of one piece at a time here. In fact, I think I'll use color right now to help us see what it is that I'm doing. So the first thing I'm going to do, the most outside function is 4 square root of something. Then on the inside, I'll have cosine of something. And then on the inside, I'll have square root of sine of x. So that's going to be my strategy. I'm going to go one piece at a time here. So on the outside, the derivative of 4 square root of something is going to be 4 divided by 2 square root of that something. And we just said that something is going to be the cosine of the square root of sine. And sorry, it's going to get a little sloppy here just for the sake of getting all the colors involved. Next, though, we need to multiply by the derivative of the inside. And the inside is now that cosine thing. So we're going to multiply by negative sine of the square root of sine. Next, and you can see I could have done an extra color here, by the way, we need to multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is the derivative of the square root of sine. So the square root of sine is going to be 1 over 2 square root of sine. You can see motivation for why I included that scalar of 4, by the way. And then, of course, times the derivative of the inside, and the derivative of sine is cosine. So what I have just done is I've literally done the chain rule. I've done a multi-step chain rule without having to write out any f of u stuff as I go through. From here, it's just a matter of simplifying it. Although, again, because you don't have to simplify, you could write out that answer. It wouldn't fit on the answer line, but beside the point. So in here, a couple things I want to do. First, I want to divide out that 4 and get rid of the 2s. It just cleans up a few pieces. Next, I want to organize the numerator and denominator separately, just so I can kind of keep things clean. Um, as I look at them, I see two things here in the denominator, both of which are under square roots. So I'm going to aim to put them both under the same square root. Again, this is just my personal choice. I just like the idea of having them there. So I'm going to go the square root of sine of x. So that's taking care of this one right here. And then I'm multiplying that times cosine of the square root of sine of x. So you can see I'm sort of simplifying it as I go, just to kind of clean it all up together. Next, we have the numerator. Again, personal choice here. I'm going to write this as negative and then cosine of x. Just there's something about having it at the beginning that feels right to me. And then that's going to be multiplied times the sine of the square root of sine x. And now I will admit that when I wrote this question, I thought hard about potentially having students plug in a value. But the problem was if I had, I guess pi over 2 would have been the great choice, but then the answer would have been 0 because of that cosine. So I just had it, you know, sort of evaluate the derivative. But there's our piece. Number 5. Number 5 became so much worse than I wanted it to, but that's okay. Like I think this is a good execution-based challenge as well as a good problem for implicit differentiation and sort of working with some awkward stuff. So we're supposed to find the derivative at e comma e. So that point should help us a little bit simplify, I think, um, for this ln equation. So there's lots of stuff going on here. There's also sort of an awkward constant. But as a heads up, anytime you see an awkward constant on one of these, that's because I want to make sure the order, the initial condition actually, or the initial condition, the point actually works in the original equation. Otherwise, the problem's broken. So in here, I'm going to take the derivative of the right side first. I think the right side's just a lot easier. So I'll do that first. This one's going to require the product rule. So we're going to have 3x squared y squared plus x cubed times 2y y prime. And we're letting y prime stand for dy dx. And then all minus 0. So it covers the first bit. On the left side, on the other hand, we're, we're going to have sort of an adventure here. In fact, I'm going to prepare to give myself a little bit of room. This is the one where I had the most trouble fitting it onto my page. Because I do it all. I do the first six questions and the second five, respectively, on each one individual page. So down here, we're going to have ln of something. So it's going to be over that something. So this will be 1 half x squared plus 1 half y squared. And then up top, we'll have the derivative of each piece. So the derivative of 1 half x squared is x. And derivative of 1 half y squared is y. But we also need a y prime. So you can tell there's going to be some adventures here. So next, in looking at this, the next thing I want to do is I just want to clear the, the denominator. I just don't like that that denominator's there. And in fact, I'm going to I dislike it enough. I'm going to get rid of that this is minus 0. And I'm going to multiply both sides by 1 half x squared plus y squared, 1 half y squared. So again, this is one of those strategies. In a sense, I'm going to eventually need to get the y prime terms all together. 
And one good strategy for doing that is just to um, sort of clear out all of the denominators so that way we don't have trouble sort of moving around denominators with all those pieces. So now in addition, there's one other move I'm gonna make that I think is super helpful. I'm gonna multiply both sides by two. Now on the left side, that's not gonna do much. It's just gonna give us two X plus two Y, Y prime. On the right side though, when I multiply that two in, by associativity, I can choose where to put it. And I'm gonna put it on that side because that will make this factor X squared plus Y squared, which is just so much cleaner that I, I think it's almost essential. I think you almost have to do it. So from here, once I've done that, I've now got X squared plus Y squared being multiplied into here. So I'm gonna go ahead and distribute that as well. This is again, one of those features or one of those things that I'll do to be a little bit more efficient. This will be three X squared Y squared times X squared plus Y squared. I know this looks bad, but remember we're gonna be evaluating at E comma E, so there's some symmetry between X and Y. On the next one, we'll have two X cubed Y times X squared plus Y squared, oops, all times Y prime. And now at this point, this is again one of those strategic spots. I could solve for y prime, which is what I did on the actual thing, which is part of my problem. I forgot we were supposed to evaluate it e comma e initially. I'm not gonna make that mistake here. I'm gonna go ahead and plug in e and e for x and y respectively, because I think that's gonna save us a lot of trouble. So what do we get? We'll get 2e plus 2ey prime equals over here, this will be e squared times e squared. So that's gonna be 3e to the fourth and then on the inside, e squared plus e squared is 2e squared. On the next one, we'll have 2e to the third times e, which is 2e to the fourth. Interesting that there's some symmetry there. And then once again, e squared plus e squared is 2e squared, but this time there's a y prime. So already we've cleaned this up so much just by making that substitution. Now in here, I'm gonna clean this up just a little bit. Again, sort of preemptive cleanup. So this is gonna be, it looks like 6e to the sixth plus four e to the sixth y prime. And now I notice that all the terms are even. So again, you don't have to do this, but this just feels like a good move to me. I'm gonna go ahead and multiply both sides by one half, just to sort of clean it up a little bit. That'll give me e plus e y prime equals three e to the sixth plus two e to the sixth y prime. And now I can collect the pieces together. So I'm gonna go ahead and move over the e y prime so minus e y prime, and I'm also gonna move over the three e to the sixth. So and I'm wondering if there's gonna be a GCF we can pull out here as well, but for the moment, we'll just go with it. We'll have e minus three e to the sixth equals on that other side, two e to the sixth minus e, there is gonna be some, but all of that's times y prime, so I'll GCF it out. Next, I'm gonna move everything over to the left side. So I'm gonna divide both sides by two e to the sixth minus e. And finally, I've gotten y prime alone, which for us is the same thing as computing dy dx, but I noticed that each of these pieces has a GCF of e, so I'm gonna factor out an e for each for each of them. It's gonna leave me one minus three e to the fifth on top, and down below that'll be, sorry, e came out, so e times two e to the fifth minus one. The e's divide out, and that leaves us with our answer. So dy dx in this case, at that point, e comma e, is going to be one minus three e to the fifth, divided by two e to the fifth minus one, or if you wanted to write it in a slightly different way, you could multiply up and down by negative one, and you'd get this. And I don't remember which one I had, basically one of those two. Yeah, I didn't, it looks like I didn't factor out the GCF. So there we go, there's our stuff. So number five, super crunchy, but again, I think if there's one strategy that really does the trick here, I think that it's plugging in E comma E early. Like the early bird gets the worm, the early bird also gets to avoid a super complicated looking derivative. So there you go. Number six, I'd say this is one of the simpler problems on here. It does involve some fractional exponents, which can be a little uncomfortable for students, especially ones that had to learn that during the pandemic. But at the same time, it's a pretty straightforward problem. So we're doing the mean value theorem. So we're first gonna calculate the average rate of change. It's gonna be f of eight minus f of one, all over eight minus one. Cleaning that up a little bit. This will be three times the cube root of eight minus the cube root of one. I just factored out a GCF of three. It'll all be over seven. So basically three sevenths is our average rate of change. That needs to be equal to f prime of x. Now what is f prime of x? Well, this is x to the one third power. So that's gonna be three times one third x to the negative two thirds. Notice the threes divide away. 
what we've ended up with is the equation. 3 sevenths equals x to the negative 2 thirds, which is the same thing as 1 over x to the 2 thirds. So from here, I'm going to make a couple moves. I'm going to take the reciprocal of both sides, or flip both sides. It's going to clean this up a little bit. We'll have 7 thirds equals x to the 2 thirds. And now we need to raise both sides to the same power in order to get here. I mean, you could also decompose it a couple different ways, by the way. I'm just going to choose to do it this way. I'm going to raise both sides to the 3 halves power. The only problem is, when you raise something to the 3 halves power, that's the same thing as square rooting it to the third power, which means we also have to take into account that there's a possibility of a negative here. In fact, what we've just gotten is that x could be plus or minus. Shoot, is there a clean way to write that? No, I'll just write it that way. Plus or minus 7 thirds to the 3 halves power. Now, with that said, if you forgot about the minus possibility, you'd actually be fine in this case because we're on the interval from 1 to 8, which means there cannot be a negative possibility here. Therefore, x is equal to 7 over 3 to the 3 halves power. As far as other ways to write, I mean, this is the answer. This is what I was looking for. If you wanted to write it differently, you could raise both of those to the third power. Shoot, what's 7 to the third? Is that 343, I want to say? So 343 over 27, and that's all square rooted. But of course, if you wanted to rationalize this, you could get, of course, 7 over 3 times the square root of 7 over the square root of 3. And if you multiply up and down by root 3 to rationalize, again, you don't have to do this. I'm just pointing out that it's a possibility here. You'd get 7 root 21 over, shoot, what is that, 9? There we go. That would also work. But again, nobody went that route. I didn't go that route. I just thought it was interesting. So there we go. Again, I think a really simple problem, but with some extra algebra to twist at you. So number seven, um, itself usually a pretty easy problem, especially in the regular standard quiz if you know your an analysis tools. But in this case, you're usually given some sort of twist on the problem. So in this case, we got the graph of f prime, but we're told that g of x equals f, or negative f of x. So it's the reciprocal of this thing. The question we're asking though is when is g decreasing and concave down? So let's think about this. We have f prime. Let's think about what g prime would be in terms of f prime. g prime is just negative f prime of x. So in other words, the derivative we see here is just flipped from the derivative that we're looking to analyze. So in that case, as I think about this, if we want, here, let's look at it this way. If we want g to be decreasing and concave down, then that's the same thing as having f be increasing and concave up. And you can think about a little bit about why, but it's because of that extra negative sign. Negative is going to flip that relationship each time. For us then that means that f prime is going to be positive, and we're going with a loose definition here, increasing, we'll accept kind of strictly increasing or increasing either way you choose to go. f prime has to be positive and increasing. So we are looking for where f prime is positive and increasing because that will mean that g prime is negative and decreasing, which matches exactly what we want up here. I'm pointing at the screen as though you can see where my finger's pointing. So there we go. We want f prime to be positive and increasing. Looking at our picture, again, we'll go with the, we'll go with strictly here. There it is. It looks like x would be in the intervals from a to b as well as from e to infinity. If you prefer inequalities, which I tend to be a person that prefers inequalities, you could say that a is less than x is less than b, or x is greater than e. And like I said, yeah, we'd accept this one as well. It's a little bit ambiguous which way you'd want to go, but either of those two versions are the answers I was looking for. So there we go. So again, I think interpreting the derivative and just thinking about the relationship and what that negative sign does is more than enough to work through this problem quickly. For number eight, I made this one a lot cleaner. I think this is one of the easier problems, although there is some GCF work that can kind of mess with people here, some chain rule built in. You're just asked to find the critical number, just the critical number, nothing else. So for us, that means that we'd be looking for where f prime of x is equal to zero or undefined, but this function's not going to have any undefined, so we won't have to worry about that. Instead, we'll just go take the derivative. So we got the product rule. Derivative of mx plus b with respect to x is just m, so this is m e to the negative x. On the next one, we're going to have mx plus b, excuse me, times the derivative of e to the negative x. 
which is negative e to the negative x by the chain rule. So pulling this together a little bit, I'll be super careful here just to make sure. This is gonna be m e to the negative x plus, and I'm gonna distribute that negative sign inside here. It's just my own personal strategy for handling it. Now I'm gonna GCF out the e to the negative x, which I know isn't gonna contribute anything to our um, critical numbers list. Um, plus it says the critical number, so it's gonna to have to be on the other portion. So this means we'll have m minus mx minus b, and we wanna figure out when this is equal to zero. As we said, I mean, e to the negative x would be zero at infinity, but that's not a number. So our only possibility here to consider is that m minus mx minus b is equal to zero. So let's solve that. First thing I'm gonna do, I think it's fastest, I'm gonna add mx to both sides. And then I need to solve for m, or solve for x, excuse me. It's gonna give us the one critical number is m minus b divided by m. I will say that there is one extra piece here. It is that m cannot equal zero. I think you can see exactly why in the answer because then you'd be dividing by zero. So it wouldn't work in that particular case. But we are covered. So basically there's our answer. And again, it didn't want to ask for any analysis. I thought about using something like where it's increasing or decreasing, which might have included some cases depending on the value of m or the value of b. Just went with the critical number. Thought the algebra was more valuable. The product rule, chain rule in algebra. Number nine. So number nine in itself looks super crunchy, but the truth is, because we know so few anti-differentiation techniques here in the first half of calculus AB, um, this first half of the second half of calculus AB, there we go, the integral portion, basically this has to be U substitution. If it's not U substitution, then it's either something that's gonna like just break down instantly, or it's not solvable. So basically, let's assume it's U sub. U would be equal to whatever's on the inside, I think in the best case scenario. I see inside there, the square root of three x squared plus five. Now you might think to yourself, why would I want to go with that whole thing? Well, I see a two square root of three x squared plus five in the denominator. That looks like it probably came from that. So I'm gonna run with it. Du, okay, this is gonna take a little bit here. Obviously it'll be something dx. The derivative of the square root is two square root of that stuff. And then finally, the derivative of the inside of that square root is gonna be six x. Now go ahead and clean up the 6x over 2 and just write it instead as 3x. And then from here, if you feel like you need that extra step, we can write this entire piece as the square root of 3x squared plus 5 divided by 3x, all times du is equal to dx. So with that said, let's go substitute in. We're going to have 7x f prime of u. In our, de in our denominator, We've still got that two square root. I can tell it's gonna go away, but again, I'm doing this mechanically the way that we do at the beginning. So square root of three x squared plus five divided by three x. Notice a bunch of things clean up here. Square root's gone. The x is gone. That's exactly what we needed because otherwise we couldn't finish the integral this way. And then I see a couple scalars, seven, two, and three. So I'm gonna pull out the scalars as seven over six. And our integrand now, amazingly, is just the integral of f prime of u du. And that is going to give us an antiderivative of 7 sixth f of u plus c. So from here, I want to back substitute. That's sort of the last thing here. We said u is that piece. So our antiderivative in terms of x, once again, will be 7 sixth of f of something plus c. And that something is the square root of 3x squared plus 5. So again, I think this is another one that in, for me, I would consider it to be a really easy problem because even though there's a lot of stuff going on there, we only have that one strategy, it's U sub. So you've just got to look at the problem and decide what you want to try to make the substitution. And in truth, you could have started with three X squared plus five and you would have gotten somewhere, not all the way there. You would have eventually needed to do the square root. But at the same time, like we just have to use U sub. If it looks crunchy at all, try U substitution. Number 10, so number 10, I technically cheated. This is a BC question in a sense. Um, it's an improper integral, so I will do it formally. Not that I was expecting that of AB students who haven't learned um, improper integral like notation, how to like formally do them with limits and everything, but it's just an impl improper integral. But once again, despite its crunchiness, it's gotta be U substitution. We only have U substitution. So once again, for the moment, let's play around for a moment. So let's do this. Let's let u equal the power of e. And once again, that's sort of me anticipating it, but also I just don't see anything else and two over x is in, inside the exponential function. So we'll go with it. If u is equal to two over x, du is equal to negative two over x squared dx. 
And I think this one can be helpful to kind of move it around. We're gonna get negative x squared over two times du equals dx. Likewise, again, since this is AB, I'm not gonna do the formal improper integral work with the limits. I think I said I was going to, I lied, I'm not going to. Instead, I'm just gonna make the variable switch here. So first, if x is equal to infinity, then that implies that u, which is two over x, is gonna be equal to two over infinity, which is zero. Again, if we were doing this formally, we'd take the limit as b goes to, like we do all sorts of stuff with limits. We're not doing this because it's calculus AB. We haven't learned improper integrals yet. Similarly, but without any of those caveats, if x is equal to one, then that means u is equal to two over one, which means u is equal to two. So our integral will now be here for transformed. This will now be the integral from two to zero, which is awkward, but we'll take care of that. It'll be of three e to the u over five x squared. And then we're replacing dx with negative x squared over two du. So lots of stuff here, but fortunately lots of stuff that will divide out. First, I can divide out the x squared. Now we're in terms of u, we know we can do this. Second, I can pull out that whole massive scalar, which amounts to negative three over 10. And then our integral from two to zero of just plain old e to the u du. Now I'm gonna make one more switch. I see this negative sign and that the limits of integration are flipped. That just sort of bugs me. Like it's just something that bugs me. So I'm gonna go ahead and take care of those pieces. Actually leave them circled. I'm gonna take care of that by using the reversal property for definite integrals. This will be three tenths the integral from zero to two of e to the u du. That anti-differentiates to three tenths e to the u. And we're gonna evaluate that from zero to two. And at this point it becomes super clean because we did that subbing in. This will be three tenths e squared. I'm gonna factor out the three tenths of the scalar minus e to the zero. That's going to be three tenths of e squared minus one. The end. So once again, the only technique we got is u sub. Yeah, there was the infinity there, but it didn't matter. u sub and you're able to work your way through. Again, there, we're missing the limits for improper integrals, but this is a course that doesn't attack that particular concept. So I wasn't expecting students to do that. Number 11, the last no calculator problem. So therefore the last problem that's reasonable to do on here. But looking at this, like starting things off, the average value of f of x on two to 10 is three. So as I've mentioned before in class, in a lot of cases, like the first move I'm gonna make is try to translate what's there into an integral because then we can use that information. So this is saying the average value on two to 10, so that's one over eight times the integral from two to 10 of f of x dx is equal to three. Well, let's multiply by eight on both sides so we can get the value of an integral. The integral from two to 10 of f of x dx is equal to 24. So that's helpful. That's good information right there. I need that information, I bet, to finish this problem. The next thing we have is we wanna see, well, what else do we got? Well, on our, the rest of our problem, we're talking about the integral from seven to 10 and the integral from two to seven. So here's what I'm gonna start with. The integral from two to seven of f of x dx plus the integral from seven to 10 of f of x dx is equal to the integral from two to 10 of f of x dx. It's another one of our definite integral properties. You can see what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find a uh, connection between all these pieces so I can solve for some other missing piece. Yeah, eventually we're gonna have to deal with a more complicated thing, but for the moment, let's at least line all this stuff up properly. So for two to 10, we know that's equal to 24. Huge help right there, we already did that work. For seven to 10, we also know from the problem that that's equal to nine. What we don't know is the integral from two to seven, which coincidentally is the one we're gonna be using here in a second. But frankly, we have the ability to do this. If we subtract nine from both sides, we're gonna get that that third integral. So for us here, let's see if I can steal it down just so we have it. That third integral is going to be equal to 24 minus nine, which is 15. And that's the key for us to finish this problem basically. So we now want to evaluate the integral from two to seven of two f of x plus five. I'm gonna break that down again with integral properties. This will be two times the integral from two to seven of f of x dx plus the integral from two to seven of five dx. Looking at our pieces, we found the integral from two to seven of f of x dx is equal to 15. So I'll substitute that in. 
On the other hand, we know how to anti-differentiate 5. It's 5x, or we could treat it as geometry, or geometry with a um, rectangle. So we evaluate it from 2 to 7. We're going to end up with, come on, 30 plus 35 minus 10. That's going to be 20 plus 35, which is equal to 55. And 55 is most definitely our answer to question 11. Our final piece comes from the calculator section where there are three questions, each of which requires you to use the calculator. And I think that's always worth pointing out on the standard quiz or any calculator portion of a calculus exam, whether I offer it or the AP exam offers it. There may be questions where you can work through the problem without a calculator, but you have a calculator. You should be using the calculator to anti-differentiate, to not anti-differentiate, to evaluate definite integrals, to calculate and solve problem or equations, like all sorts of stuff. So keep that in mind. That's going to be part of my strategy here, to use the calculator rather than like force me to do grindy algebra. So our first one, we have two trapezoids that are estimating the integral from 0 to 10, and it says that estimate is about 42, and we're supposed to find the value of k. So let's see. So based on that, we can do two trapezoids. Two trapezoids, our first one's going to have a width of 6, so 6 divided by 2 times root k plus e to the k. The next one is going to have width 4 over 2, so e to the k plus pi. We know that whole thing's supposed to be equal to 42. From here, I'm just going to clean it up a little bit. That'll be 3 root k plus 3 e to the k plus 2 e to the k plus 2 pi. That's all going to be equal to 42. And yeah, you could subtract over 2 pi, or you could even go a step further here and do 3 root k plus 5 e to the k equals 42 minus 2 pi. In fact, I think that's what I'll go with. But at this point, I want to use my calculator to solve this equation. I want to punch it in on the calculator rather than keep trying to solve it because news for you, we're not going to be able to solve that equation by hand. It's not made for that. So let's do exactly that. So we need to punch in those two halves of the equation. I do 3 square root of k. But notice I'm putting in x. Obviously, we're using a graphing calculator. They're fine-tuned for that. So then we'll go e to the x. So does that work? Oh, I put everything under the square root. Look at how easy it is to do that. Because I'm not paying attention. There it is. OK, there. Plus 5e e to the k. And then finally, we have 42 minus 2 pi. Now, as a heads up before I graph, I know 42 minus 2 pi is fairly large. That's about 42 minus, let's say, 6 or 7. So it's going to be in the 35, 36 range. So I'm going to go ahead and make my window. Oh, it's already kind of up there. I'm going to make my window go from negative 10 to 10. And then I'll do my y values from 0 to 40. Let's see what we got. Nope, came out really fast. We want to find that one intersection point. So second calc, we'll go to intersect, enter, enter, enter. It says 1.845 is approximately our answer. So that's exactly what we're going to put. OK, it's approximately 1.845. So solved really, really quickly. Question 13, um, definitely a, a bit of a challenge here, uh, especially because there's just lots of variables to sort of track out here. It says the derivative of function f is given by f prime equals that thing. And you know what? I'm going to punch that into the calculator before we do anything else, just to make sure that we have it ready to go. So first I'll go back to zoom 6. Next I'm going to clear these. I just want to have it ready because I know we're going to use the calculator. That's why we're on the calculator section. 4 square root of 5 to the x, and then minus x to the third. So what are we seeing here? OK, so there's our graph. That, that, helps, that helps a ton. Just being able to see that graph will help us navigate this quite a bit. So there's our graph. I think I usually sketch it on the paper, but so, so it goes. OK, so next, let's translate the information. It says first that f has a local maximum at c comma 12. Okay, so thinking about that, if we have a local maximum, that means f prime is going to change from positive to negative, and that happens right here. So based on that, we can figure out what the value of c is. So in fact, let's do that. Let's just do one little piece at a time here. I'm just going to kind of collect information and then store the values on my calculator so that that way I have them. So let's find that 0. So 2 is 0. We're going to go left bound, right bound, enter. So it tells us that 0 is 0 0.5476. 0 0.5476 dot 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 and I want to actually call this C um, and it's a little easier because we already defined it here but I'm just gonna call it C so I'm gonna exit out I'm gonna do X store as alpha C and now our calculator knows that's our value of C 
So we've got some information there. It's also worth pointing out because of this little piece, that means that f of c is equal to 12. And the reason I'm thinking about that is I'm thinking this might use the alternate fundamental theorem since they're giving us info about some points. What's next? Next, there's a local minimum at D comma H. It makes me think of designated hitter, which is now universal in Major League Baseball if they have a season. Not thrilling, but it is what it is. So right there is where F prime is going from negative to positive. So let's go figure out what D is going to be equal to. So following the exact same pattern, but doing a zero on the other side. Let's go second calc. We're going to do another zero. This time we're going to go to the far side. So enter, enter, enter. So negative 1.2853, 1.2853, dot, dot, dot. We're going to call this capital D. So on our calculator, we will exit x store alpha D. So now we have C and D both in there. So important stuff. Also important to note that F of D is equal to H. And the reason I bring that up is that we are supposed to find H. So in other words, we're going to need to use the information that we have provided to us. The question is, well, what do we have provided to us? We have the derivative. We have a function value. And we are looking for another function value. This really does all scream to use the fundamental theorem or specifically the alternate fundamental theorem. So I'm going to do that. We want to solve for D. So I don't know. I'm going to go this way. We'll do the integral from c to d of f prime of x dx, which again is in our calculator right now as function y sub one, so we can do that pretty fast. It's going to be equal to f of d, which we're trying to find, by the way, just to remind you, this is h, and then minus f of c. But remember, f of c is equal to 12. So from here, if we want to find h, we just need to add 12 to both sides. So it's going to be 12 plus the integral from c to d of f prime of x dx. And looking on our calculator, oops, and we'll write it as an approximation. We only have to be accurate to three decimals on these things. Punching it in here, what do we got? We got 12 plus math nine. It'll be the integral from c to d. And then of alpha trace y sub one in terms of x. Punch that in just to be safe. That was y sub one, we did it correctly. So our value will be 8.632. And again, if I had more time, I would go through and actually like show you, we could graph this function's antiderivative using an integral function. We could check to see if this actually matches where the local minimum is. But, um, well, you know what, I can do it and then use the magic of editing to show you that it worked. Okay, the magic of editing. Here is our function, there we are up there. So what did we conclude? We said that there was supposed to be a minimum at d comma h, which would be negative 1.28 and 8.632. Negative 1.28 something, 8.632. Good job, us. Finally, that brings us to the last problem on here. And I will say, I think this one is um, challenging in some ways, but not if you make a quick observation at the beginning. I think the, ne the next week's one is a little more challenging. So in here, we are given a derivative, we're given a function value, and actually we're given the other function value. So in your mind, you can already sort of realize like, oh, okay, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to find something. And in fact, that's what we're gonna need to find. We're gonna need to find k. But this problem isn't asking us to find k, it's asking us to find another function value. So there's sort of this like triplicate three values in here that we need to work our way through. But be patient, we can make this work. Let's start with what we have. We have a derivative, two function values, that means that the integral of g prime of t dt evaluated from, I don't know, let's go from three to seven is gonna be equal to g of five, or g of seven, excuse me, g of seven minus g of three. Now what that gives us though is two different pieces. It's gonna be the integral from three to seven of k times cosine of t plus ln of t dt and it's gonna be equal to 10 minus five. So let's go ahead and just kind of substitute since that's equal to 10 minus five, let's just put in five. So at this point, this is where people can get kind of lost. You might feel like, okay, we need to anti-differentiate this, but no, no, we're on a calculator problem. We're on the calculator section doing a problem. 
And cosine of t plus ln of t doesn't fit substitution. We don't have a way to attack that. In fact, I believe there's no closed form antiderivative for it. Instead, what we can do is we can use another definite integral property. We can factor out that k, and then as weird as it is, this thing is just something our calculator knows the value of. So let's watch that, let's see it in action here. So on here, I'll clear all that out. Math nine will go from three to seven. It's going to be of the inside part at least. Cosine of x plus the ln of x. And it's gonna be in terms of x. So it says that integral, just the definite integral part, is equal to 1.04041, et cetera, et cetera. I'm gonna store that on my calculator as alpha a. So I just wanna give it a name. So what we've just found is that k times a is equal to five. So if we wanna solve for k, we just need to divide by a. So k is going to be five over a. And in here, obviously I could write out what this value is, but I don't really care to. Instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna have my calculator remember that. Five divided by a, and I'm gonna store that as alpha k. So 4.8057 something, we've got what our value is. In a sense, we've now secured what k is equal to. So how does that help us? Well, remember what we were trying to find here was ultimately g of 11. So I'm gonna set up a new version of this problem, sort of a second attempt. I'm gonna do the integral from, we have two choices here. I'm just gonna to choose to use the closer one. I'm gonna go the integral from seven to 11. So I'm choosing the x values there based on what we have and what we want. Could have done from three to 11. The integral from seven to 11 of g prime of t dt is gonna be equal to g of 11 minus 10. g of 11 that we're trying to find is gonna be equal to 10 plus that integral from seven to 11 of g prime. The difference is, now when we go to put in g prime, we know the value of k. We have the value of k now to punch in. So we just need to include it in our integral and we're going to be okay. So let's go do that. So we're gonna go, again I'll clear this out, or I don't have to I guess, 10 plus math nine. The integral we have is running from, it looks like seven to 11. Hey, like where you get the Slurpees. So seven to 11, it's gonna be in terms of x. And inside we're going to have alpha k, because remember we stored it as k, and then we're gonna multiply times the rest of that function. So cosine, I'll multiply, cosine of x plus ln of x. Close her off. When I press enter, it gives me 11.391. So g of 11 is approximately 11.391. And with that, we have completed the plus standard quiz from week three. Thank you for watching. Hopefully you've seen some interesting problems in here and some interesting work or techniques or approaches. Seems like there's a lot of um, definite integral properties or integral properties that show up. I think that's true. Those are pretty fundamental, but it's kind of cool how you can cleverly apply them in order to work through a pretty challenging question. But um, again, I enjoy making these things and I enjoy, or I enjoy writing them, I enjoy solving them, and I enjoy talking about them a little bit. So obviously I went a little slower than I would if I was doing it by hand just by myself, but also I was hopefully a little bit more careful than I would have been otherwise. In any event, thanks for watching and have a great rest of your evening, whatever it might be when you're watching this. Bye.